Hasta la vista, baby. Terminator 2 is hailed as possibly the greatest sequel in history. I am not here to tear the movie apart. I'm a fan too, so put down the pitchforks. Even though I'm about to pick apart one scene in this movie, I still enjoyed it. We're just here about the science in one scene. Terminator 2, up to the iconic steel mill scene, is largely plausible. The only real fantastical thing in the entire movie is time travel to the past. Call me a classical Vulcan, but I dare say that time travel to the past is impossible. However, the steel mill scene, with its open ponds of molten steel, stretches credibility even more than time travel. We don't have much time. Some YouTube reactors refer to the molten steel as lava. Lava is natural molten rock and ores. Molten steel is referred to as, oddly enough, molten steel. Notice that as the truck enters the steel mill here, the ladle is composited right there at the entrance. Right there. Low to the ground, close to the entrance, where vehicles can drive by and have their paint jobs bubbled off. The set designers don't want you to forget that you're in a steel mill. Instead of just settling for a factory setting with an occasional sighting of steel workers, there are impossible ponds of molten steel everywhere, leaking and dripping for no reason. And let's take a closer look at those catwalks hovering directly above vats of molten steel. There is a catwalk over this ladle, but no human and few superheroes could stand there above the molten steel while it pours. Molten steel radiates intense heat. You see this volcanic magma? You can't stand near that much lava for long without safety gear, and lava is hundreds of degrees cooler than molten steel. Walking on a catwalk directly above would be impossible. We're talking skin peeling from your flesh impossible. Even with protective gear, no. Okay, no steel mill has molten steel wishing wells. Now for that tanker truck. The liquid nitrogen spill should have killed Sarah and John. A typical 18-wheeler tanker truck used for transporting liquid nitrogen usually has a capacity of about 7,000 gallons. A gallon is 3.8 liters. Let's just say four liters. That's 26,498 liters, weighing 47,110 pounds, or 21,375 kilograms. That much liquid nitrogen spilled in a workplace, even with a large open entryway for ventilation, would still be dangerous. Here's what might happen. The liquid nitrogen would vaporize, expand, and displace oxygen. Liquid nitrogen expands rapidly, approximately 695 times its liquid volume. It would physically push the existing air out the doors so forcibly that you would actually feel an increase in air pressure. Imagine 695 tanker trucks in that area. That's how much space the contents of that truck will take up. This would significantly reduce the oxygen levels in the air, leading to asphyxiation. In fact, for a while, you would be hard pressed to locate a molecule of oxygen in any single nook or cranny that's not behind a closed door. Like carbon dioxide, nitrogen is not toxic. You're breathing 78% nitrogen right now and about 21% oxygen. Even though your body is about 3% nitrogen from food and drink, your respiratory system completely ignores the nitrogen in the air we breathe, much like it ignores carbon dioxide. Inhaling air with reduced oxygen levels, or in this case, almost no oxygen, can cause symptoms like rapid breathing, confusion, loss of consciousness, and death. The air would seem fine and fresh, but if Sarah and John tried to run out, they would have collapsed on the way. And if the Terminator didn't pick them up and carry them out to open air, they would die. Prolonged direct exposure to liquid nitrogen or its vapors could cause severe cold burns and frostbite to anyone nearby. Arnold was only a few feet away, and his flesh should have been frostbitten or cracked off. He may have also been operating below his temperature range. CPUs might like the cold, but not motors and tendons. Hasta la vista, baby.
Hasta la Vista Baby is one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's most iconic one-liners, possibly surpassing I'll be back, get to the choppa, and it's not a tumor. But what the Terminator did after saying it was a grave mistake, the T-1000 was frozen and vulnerable. The Terminator should have tossed him into the molten steel pond. There, the T-1000 would have perished. And it goes back to a concept we all learned in chemistry class. You were paying attention, right? It's surface area. Surface area is the total area that the surface of a three-dimensional object occupies. It is a measure of the extent of the object's surface and is expressed in square units. For instance, square meters or square inches. A two-inch cube has six sides or surfaces. It doesn't matter whether it's inches or centimeters. The numbers will be the same. Each side has an area of two inches by two units, which equals four square units. Adding up all the sides, you get a total surface area of four plus four plus four plus four plus four plus four plus four, which equals 24 square units from a two unit cube. But what if you break that cube? To make it easier to calculate, we'll slice the cube exactly in half and make two blocks. Now in the left half, we have two plus two plus two plus two plus four plus four, which equals 16 square inches from a one by two inch cube. The same amount of frozen metal, each half now has 16 square inches of surface area, totaling 32 square inches. We cut in in half and went from 24 to 32 square inches. How does this happen? When you break open an object, you create a brand new surface. In the case of this cube, we create two totally new two by two surfaces. If you could slice this cube half a million times, you could cover an IMAX screen with the slices. You can imagine how quickly these thin slices would melt. And that's the point of increased surface area. Extremely small shards and slivers will melt very quickly, even instantaneously. We learned in chemistry class that when you want to melt or dissolve a substance, one way to speed it up is to increase the surface area. It's like the difference between stirring granulated sugar into your coffee versus a sugar cube. Granulated sugar dissolves more readily because it has more surface area. It's the very reason we granulate it. When the Terminator shot the T-1000, he created thousands, perhaps millions, of new surface areas for the T-1000 to absorb heat from the mill. Mind you, because of that huge liquid nitrogen spill, that area was going to be cold for a long time. This was a human habitable area designed to keep the heat of the molten steel away. But for the sake of the movie, let's say some of the heat rolled right in. The surface area of an average adult male is approximately 18,440 square centimeters, or 2,858 square inches. This increased substantially when the T-1000 was shattered. Heat was able to invade the frozen metal from millions of new access points. As a frozen statue, the T-1000 would have surely stayed frozen for more than a day. Anyone who has ever defrosted a turkey knows how long a big chunk of cold can stay cold. Breaking the T-1000 up like that sped the process, but they still had time to shove most of him, hopefully including his CPU, onto the molten steel instead of watching him reform. Or they could have run. I say onto the molten steel instead of into because steel is very dense and it's not like water. The T-1000 would have spattered and rolled on top like mercury. If he could take form and tried to stand, he would have sunk a little. There's a very slight danger that he could have arced himself out like a blob, but I'm guessing that once he thawed, his CPU would have quickly been operating way out of spec from the heat, and he would have crashed. More on that later. And just to drive home the point about how long it takes for cold to dissipate, let me share a personal experience. I live in the South where the summers are notoriously hot. Recently, I had to defrost my freezer and I threw ice onto the lawn by my driveway. This was in the middle of summer with temperatures soaring. And yet, the next day I still found some ice remaining. So much so that I was afraid for my grass. That's how persistent cold can be, even in extreme heat. Now, let's go back to the T-1000 scene. He's lying on the floor, surrounded by puddles of liquid nitrogen. We've already established that liquid nitrogen creates a massive amount of cold. Its boiling point is negative 320 degrees. If there are puddles there, it's so cold 
It's dangerous to even walk there. And here's the thing, cold air is denser than hot air. It will linger lower in the room. So while the hot air in the steel mill would be rising, the cold air from the liquid nitrogen would be clinging to the ground, creating a layer of intense cold. The T-1000 was essentially lying in vapors of super cooled air, with even cooler liquefied air beneath. He was splashing through it. Just like my ice on the lawn, that cold wouldn't have just vanished instantly. It would have lingered, slowing down the thawing process, possibly for over a day. So even with the increased surface area from the gunshot, the T-1000 was battling against a significant amount of residual cold. 7,000 gallons of liquid nitrogen will have a massive heat sink. Even though it's mostly vaporized, it has absorbed an enormous amount of heat from the room, leaving everything very cold. Thermal equilibrium. It takes a considerable amount of time for a large space to reach thermal equilibrium, especially after such a dramatic temperature drop. Supercooled surfaces. The walls, floor, and objects in the room will have absorbed the cold, and they will release that cold back into the air slowly. Nitrogen gas properties. Nitrogen gas is a poor conductor of heat, and the room is filled with it. This means it will take time for the room to warm up, even if there's a heat source. Localized heat versus ambient cold. Even if there's a localized heat source, like the molten steel nearby, the overall ambient temperature of the room will remain very cold for a significant period. So a rough estimate of thaw time. Initial cold. Immediately after the spill, the room would be dangerously cold, well below freezing. If you're there, you will suffer way more than frostbite. First hour. The ambient temperature would rise slowly but still remain extremely cold. Two to six hours later, the room might warm up to a human habitable temperature, even with a heating system. By the way, the industrial heating system might not kick in if it's gas powered because there is not enough oxygen. Supercooled materials. The objects and surfaces in the room would continue to warm up, potentially for many hours or even days, depending on their thermal mass. The T-1000 being a 60-liter, 15-gallon volume of metal would be significantly influenced by the lingering cold of the room. Even if there's a localized heat source, the ambient temperature would remain cold, slowing the thawing process. The supercooled surfaces and the nitrogen gas would act as a constant source of cold, delaying the T-1000's recovery. Frankly, if John and Sarah weren't frozen to death and not deceased from asphyxiation, they would have plenty of time to escape or to chuck that T-1000 into the amazingly accessible molten steel. Believe it or not, there's more to pick apart in this scene, but I hope we all learned some things here. I certainly did. What are your thoughts? What did I miss? What did I get wrong? Hit me up in the comments. Until next time, keep learning from science fiction.